Greg Nagel, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Let's talk about imaging. I'm going to define imaging as uh, block restoring the contents of a disk image to a hard drive or SSD, resulting in a fully booting. See that I'm running two computers here, and I'm hitting the wrong arrow. Uh, resulting in a in a fully working machine, and Mac admins have been doing this for years to consistently and repeatedly get a machine in a known working state. We keep hearing that imaging is dead, dying, certainly no longer recommended. So what does that mean? What should, what should we do about that? Uh, Rich Troughton, about a year ago, speculated that with the coming of the APFS file system from Apple that imaging would be dead because we wouldn't have the tools to create and, and restore images from the APS file system. That seemed like a pretty good guess at the time. But as it turns out, Apple did update ASR to be able to restore, to create images from APS volumes and to be able to restore them. And Apple continues to make changes. If you look at the, uh, if you're on the current 1013.4 betas, Apple keeps tweaking ASR restore to be able to do more stuff. Uh, as the as uh, as Macs become a little bit more complicated, which we'll talk about in a bit, and many of the popular tools that people have been using to create and deploy images, like Auto Damage, Imager, Deploy Studio, have been updated to handle APFS images. But there are some concerns when doing some image when doing imaging of APFS. The biggest one is that in order to actually boot from an APFS volume, the Mac has to have the correct EFI firmware. And simply restoring a disk image to a startup disk does not update the firmware on the Mac. So you could get a machine, let's say you pull a machine out of a box that's been sitting there for a while it's, and it's still running 10.10, 10.11, you restore this APFS image to the disk, the machine may, in fact, probably won't boot because the EFI firmware does not know how to boot from APFS. It only knows how to boot from HFS plus. So very clever Mac admins have figured out ways to get that firmware, which is normally in the, the OS 10, uh, inst the Mac OS installer, get a firmware package and then you could then, in theory, restore an image to the disk and also install that firmware update package. And now you have a machine that will boot because you've updated the EFI firmware. So imaging is not dead. Thank you very much. Any questions? <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Apple is hinting to us with increasingly uh, um, dire warnings that something is up, that something we need to pay attention to something. And they posted this last summer. It's a document on how you should uh, upgrade your machines to High Sierra, especially if you're in a large uh, institution. And they discuss the recommended methods, all of which revolve around the Mac OS installer. And they specifically wave you away from using imaging as a method for upgrading machines to High Sierra. This is really somewhat weird to have to advance on both computers at the same time. So there's, there's this other weird re recommendation they make is they say that you can, well actually let's go back here. They do say that one of the reasons why you shouldn't use a, a monolithic system image is that required firmware updates may not be there. And that's what we were talking about in, in terms of the, uh, the EFI stuff not being there to allow it to, to boot. But they, there's also this weird recommendation that if you want to, try to create an image that you can use to reinstall Mac OS High Sierra, so not install it initially, but to sort of refresh the install or, or install it again, 
they tell you not to actually use the Mac OS installer, but to actually install it and then clone that machine or make an image of the install, which is this very bizarre recommendation. It's like, that's the monolithic imaging path that we've been told for years is bad, don't do that. I'm kind of skeptical about this recommendation. And I wouldn't, I think things are changing and this doesn't actually make sense. Of course, Apple hasn't updated this documentation, but perhaps they will. So they also have another document in which they warn us away from imaging. They tell us that if you use traditional imaging methods, that the Mac may be in an unsupported and unstable state. I'd like to point out, though, that Apple might mean more than EFI firmware when they talk about important firmware updates that might be missing. Last year, Apple shipped the Touch Bar MacBook Pro. And if you were to image this, if you were to completely wipe the internal hard drive and put an image on it, when you boot it up for the first time, you might see this. You see this sort of weird thing that asks you to connect to a network because a critical software update is required. And this is actually the software required to operate the touch bar. You restored an image to the boot volume, but the required software to make the touch bar work isn't there. It's not part of that image. So it's, it needs to connect to Apple to download that driver or that, that additional, it's actually not a driver, but the additional software needed to run that touch bar. And you actually, it's very difficult to proceed past this. You can't skip this. They really are forcing you to connect to the internet and download this software to get the Mac into a known and supported bootable state. So this is all related to the special hardware that's in the, the Touch Bar MacBook Pros. Uh, there's a, a second little chip, the T1 chip, which is a, an ARM processor, very much like what was in the, is in the Apple Watch. And it's that second computer inside your, your MacBook Pro that needs its own set of software. So the MacBook Pro was the first computer from Apple that had this sort of special software. And it's not hard to think that maybe a future version might have Face ID instead of Touch ID. Of course, Apple's talking about a new Mac Pro that's available later this year. And so maybe it will have um, Brainwave ID. But <laughs> The point here is that <laughs> Apple's, the hardware is starting to diverge. We're going to have, we'll have the sort of legacy Macs that, uh, are, that, that boot one way and have one set of capabilities. We will have these Touch ID Macs. We've got another Mac that just shipped recently that, has, that supports secure boot, and it has a completely different way of starting up from all Macs before it. There's a more advanced ARM chip sitting on the motherboard that actually controls the boot process. If this chip says, no, we're not going to boot, the Intel chip never even gets involved. It, it takes over so many of the functions on the motherboard. And you can even get the computer into a state where you have to connect it to another Mac with a Thunderbolt 3 cable and restore what's called the iBridge um, subsystem. So it's, uh, if you've ever had to restore a, a, uh, an iPhone or an iPad that won't boot and you connect it to configurator and it updates the firmware, you're gonna, you may have to do the same thing with an with a, uh, iMac Pro. And this is what it looks like. Um, I had to do this. I actually had a Mac, an iMac Pro in for testing and one day it decided to stop booting. I never did figure out why it wouldn't boot, and I ended up sending it back, but one of the troubleshooting steps I did was conne connecting it to another Mac uh, over Thunderbolt 3 and restoring the firmware. And it's, it's a very, it, it, it very much looks like connecting an iPhone or a, an, an iPad to the device. So Apple is really pushing us to not use imaging to set up a Mac but to use their installer. They want us to install instead of image. And this then allows the installer to do all the additional tasks that are required to have a fully working Mac, which might mean updating the EFI firmware. It might mean downloading, installing stuff for the T1 or T2 chips, 
or some other future changes that Apple is going to make to the hardware. Increasingly, just having the right files on the boot disk is not enough to have a fully functioning Mac. So let's take a step back and let's look at some typical setup workflows that, at, that Mac admins have been using. We're going to skip this. We're not going to talk about monolithic imaging. I hope no one here exclusively relies on it. Um, it had its place. It may even still have its place in some, uh, in some instances now, but it's very inflexible. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Instead, let's talk and look at modular imaging. So with modular imaging, you might start with a Mac installer, a Mac OS installer, and then you would add additional packages to that install, and then you would compile all of that into a disk image. Auto damage or instant image are two tools that have been used in the past to do this sort of thing. And it's a way to create an unbooted image in a repeatable manner. So when the Mac OS gets updated, or Firefox gets updated, or Xcode gets updated, you can build a new image with those new pieces, and you know it will be functionally the same as the, the previous image that you built with the older pieces. It's not a manual process. Well, it's partially manual, but at least it's structured, and it's in a tool that lets you repeat this process in a, in a consistent way. You then would deploy that image to one or more machines. To maintain those machines, you're going to pick up another piece of software. It might be Monkey, it might be Jamf, whatever. You're going to import packages into that system, and then Monkey or Jamf or FileWave, AirWatch, whatever, is going to maintain the machines. Additional updates go to the machine from that software. So the image is the starting point, but you need ongoing maintenance, and you use another tool for that. Thin imaging. With thin imaging, our image is thinner. So we put less stuff in it. We only put the OS and the bare number minimum of packages in order to get it to a state where our maintenance software can take over. Often this is referred to as bootstrapping a machine. So in my case, this would be the Mac OS installer, monkey packages, uh, maybe something that suppresses the, uh, the setup assistant and a local admin account. That's all that gets installed in the machine. Machine boots, monkey takes over, installs the rest of the stuff. And this then keeps me from having to duplicate effort. I don't have to keep Firefox updated in my image and then also keep it updated in my management system. I can do it one place. And then there's no imaging. And by that, I define you're not using a disk image at all. You're just taking the machine out of the box you're installing those bootstrapping packages. And then again, when the machine boots up for the first time, your management system takes over and does the rest of the work. And a slight tweak on no imaging, which you can use, especially if you're redeploying a machine, is you just reinstall, maybe erase and install Mac OS, and those additional bootstrapping packages, and again, let your management system take over. So that's an ins installation-based workflow. And again, Apple is pushing us towards installing instead of imaging. So let's look at some Apple-supported tools. As soon as I get my notes caught up on this other computer. One tool that Apple does recommend and support is System Image Utility. And you can use that to build a net install image so let's take a look at what that looks like. The tool itself, a lot of people, it was originally included with Mac OS Server, or OS X Server at the time. And Apple later made it available. You can, it's on every Mac now, and it's, but it's in a, a location maybe people don't know to look for. So a system library, core services, applications. You open it up. You can pick, um, the, if you have it, a, the, the uh, Install Mac OS High Sierra app downloaded local on the machine. You pick that as an install source. <coughs> Agree to the, uh, the legalese. And in this screen, you would add additional packages. And these are my bootstrapping packages. So I have a local admin account. I suppress the setup assistant. And I install the monkey tools. We'll skip some of these other things, because we don't care about them. 
and then we can save the, uh, the disk image. We decide which, uh, which models it will boot. I'm just going to leave that at the default. So save it out to the desktop. We, uh, we authenticate. Takes a few minutes to crank through. And we have a folder then on our desktop ending in .nbi, stands for Netboot, Netboot Image, and it contains the files required to boot from the network. So I would copy this then up to a Netboot server, and I could then boot from the network into uh, Mac OS High Sierra and install from there. There are some gotchas. When we were testing this workflow in the uh, High Sierra betas, we found that if you added more than one package to the additional packages, they would fail to install. Some of them would install, but, but some would not. And it seemed kind of random. We couldn't figure out um, why some were installing and some weren't. And it turned out if you only put a single package in, that would reliably install. Filed a bug on it, but uh, Apple came back and said, um, you know, as a workaround, maybe you should try just putting everything in one giant package. That worked, um, but eventually I got a reply back from Apple Developer Relations that told me that I needed to have a unique identifier, a unique product identifier for each package. And I didn't understand this response because I build all my own packages and of course I had a unique package identifier for each package. I'm not an idiot, that's what you have to do. Each package should have a unique package identifier. So what are they, what are they telling me here? I don't understand that. It took me a actually quite a long time to understand product identifier is not the same thing as package identifier. In Apple distribution style packages, there is this optional field where you can identify the overall product, which is different from the, the identification of the individual sub packages. And this was really frustrating to me because one, I'd never heard of it before. I'd never paid any attention to it. So of course I went out and I started looking at all these other packages and I couldn't find a lot of packages did not have this product identifier, including most Apple packages that I found. Um, but it turns out that you have to have this in order for the, uh, the OS X, the Mac OS installer, to use the additional packages. And you can take a look inside a package and look inside the distribution file. And what you're looking for is a product ID tag and a unique name. So I had to go back and fix all of my packages so it had this. Or you can rebuild them by using product build and, make, and explicitly adding the identifier tag to the, um, the invocation so that a, a product identifier is, is saved as part of the package. If you have an existing package, and you, that, like a third party package, you know, a vendor package that is missing that, you could expand that package out, you could edit the distribution file, you could stick in a product ID and then uh, flatten the package back out. That has the side effect of stripping any signing out of the package. Fortunately, the Mac OS installer doesn't seem to care about that and it will happily uh, install unsigned packages. But it's not a great workaround, but you, it's something you do have to do right now. I am. 99% confident that this will be fixed in a future release of uh, High Sierra. It has not been fixed yet. Uh, there's another bug which is in, I don't think Apple's going to fix because I don't think they, they understand that it is a bug. And if any of the packages that you install as part of that uh, setup workflow require a restart, Apple ignores that. So you get OS X installed. I still say OS 10. Mac OS installed. Your additional packages are installed. And for example, the monkey tools really require a reboot in order for all of the, um, the launch daemons to be working properly and the, the launch agents. But their mechanism won't do that, won't, won't bother to restart. And filed a bug on that. Apple Developer Relations came back and said, well, you know, here's a workaround. <coughs> Gee, thanks. I could have figured that one out. I'd rather they fix the bug, but they don't see it as a bug, I don't think. So going through all that, we can say that net install might work for you if you need to install additional packages that are in the format that Apple really wants them to be in, meaning they have that product identifier. They don't require a restart. If the UI is acceptable, because um, the, uh, the net install interface isn't really very flexible. You can't choose from a, 
a menu or a list of workflows. You can't really automate it. There's no default workflow that will run. Um, so it's, it may not, from a, a UI perspective, it may not work for you. Uh, and of course, it requires a NetBoot server, which you may or may not have. Are there any alternatives? Sure. Uh, Apple has another tool called Create Install Media that's buried inside the Mac OS installer. And it's a command line tool. You run it, and it will create a bootable external volume, a USB stick, a USB drive, that you could then plug into another Mac, boot from that, and run the installer from there. So you just plug in a, a, a blank drive or an empty drive. It's going to format it, so it, might, it doesn't have to be empty, but it is going to format the drive. It, it warns you that it's going to do that. You say, yep. It'll erase the disk. It'll copy over all the installation files, tell you that it's done. And then you might be confused when you open up that, that volume that it built for you, because this is what it looks like. It's just, it looks like a big empty disk that just has the install Mac OS High Sierra. And you're thinking, well, I could have done that. I could have just copied the, 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 but that's not really what it is. If you look at it in the terminal, you'll find it has a bunch of hidden files inside there. And that's where the actual, uh, the boot bits are buried in some of these other, other directories. Um, a big problem, though, with using create install media, at least as Apple ships it, is there's really no opportunity to customize the install at all. There's no way to put additional packages. You're just going to get the vanilla uh, Mac OS. But uh, Armin Briegel, who had a good session yesterday here, clued me in to a little trick here. And you can actually combine the two tools we've just talked about, the Create Install Media and the System Image Utility Net Install, to customize what is on the external disk. So you, you would use the create, um, the, the create Media, external media one, to build this, the, the Install Mac OS High Sierra disk. Then you could also use System Image Utility to build that custom customized installer that has your additional packages. And once you have both of those, you would open up the, the, the uh, net install disk image inside the NBI and steal the install Mac OS High Sierra application and just copy it over to that external media. And you're replacing the generic installer that Apple puts in there with your customized installer. And this is what the UI looks like when you're running, you're running from an external volume. So again, there's probably some, some training that you would have to do for your technicians if they were to use this, because maybe this isn't completely intuitive. And there's really no way to customize this. You know, kind of take it or leave it. Let's see if I can get my notes to catch up again with what, I'm, what we're talking about here. All right, so are there more alternatives? Sure, there's some third-party ones. These are ones that are not supported by Apple. Graham Gilbert has uh, developed something called Imager. It's been around for a few years. And um, it's an open source application that's designed to run workflows. So you know, one of the criticisms I have of the system image utility net install or net restore um, boot is there's, it's, it can do one thing. Um, Imager can present a menu of workflows that you can choose from. So you might have a workflow for restoring a high Sierra image and a workflow for restoring a, a low Sierra image. Um, but since Apple has been pushing us towards install, one of the things that we did last fall is we added support to have Imager actually install High Sierra rather than restore an image. So it runs a binary inside the installer called start OS install. So it can actually now, as part of a workflow, run the installer instead of restore an image. So if you've used Imager at all, the workflows are defined as a plist. So instead of restoring an image, we use the start OS install. We give it a path to a disk image containing the High, high Sierra installer. And it has to be the last item, because the, ins the start OS install tool from Apple triggers its own reboot at the end. So nothing else is going to happen after that runs. You still can install additional packages. I've got a bunch here. I've, uh, so there's four packages here. I've set them to install at first boot. So that mechanism still works. So what happens is those get staged to install. 
the start OS install happens afterwards, the, then the machine reboots, Mac OS is installed, it reboots again into the new OS, the mechanism that runs packages at first boot kicks in, installs your additional packages at that point, and then the machine could reboot again depending on your workflow, which is kind of what we need if we want to get monkey running properly. So you can use imager.app with startOS install support. You need a net install style net boot. There's lots of ways to build net boot volumes, but startOS install for reasons only known to Apple won't target external drives unless it is booted from a, a, a kernel that is ignoring SIP or SIP has been turned off. And not every way of building a net boot set has that type of kernel. So there's a, there's a, a narrower subset. The tool that comes with Imager called Auto NBI will build the correct type of net boot set. You can also do it from a specially crafted external boot volume. You can't, can't do just any external boot volume. It has to be one in which SIP is turned off or the kernel ignores um, SIP. And since in Auto NBI, a, a, the, the netboot style does the right thing, I wrote a script that converts an Auto NBI uh, netboot volume into a, a bootable external volume. So you can, you can use the tools that come, from, come with Imager to build that NBI and then convert that into an external disk, uh, again, a USB thumb drive or, or other external disk. Um, by the way, don't have to worry about any of the um, links I have in the presentation. At the end, there'll be a QR code, and I'll also uh, I'll publish the, uh, the links on my, uh, my blog. How much time do we have? We've still got a little bit of time. All right. So Apple threw another fun little wrench into, into our uh, lives here with the introduction of the iMac Pro. The iMac Pro is the first Mac to support secure boot. And what that ends up meaning for, for us, for admins that are tasked with deploying these, is that out of the box, the, the iMac Pro doesn't support netboot, and out of the box will not boot from external volumes. In order to boot from an external volume, you have to first boot the machine, create a local admin account, reboot into recovery mode, launch the system, the, the startup security utility, authenticate as that admin you created earlier, and only then can you turn off secure boot or say that it's legal to boot from external media. But out of the box, it won't do it. So that throws a lot of wrenches into our typical deployment methods, which tend to rely on either booting, booting from some sort of external media, whether it's a USB drive, a Thunderbolt drive, or net boot. So what's left? What can we, are there any things we can use to get stuff onto an iMac Pro out of the box? There are two. You can boot the machine into, into uh, target disk mode, or you can boot the machine in recovery. Now, I'm going to skip over what you would do with target disk mode because, at least for me, it's not particularly scalable. In order to set up a machine with target disk mode, I have to have a second Mac running the right version of OS, uh, Mac OS. I have to have the right cables. And, um, I, need to, and I, I can't guarantee that everybody that needs to do this is going to have access to those things. So I decided to focus on what could we do in recovery boot. And I wrote a little tool called Bootstrapper, which is just a, uh, it's a, uh, a bash script. And what you can do is you can, you put that tool and some packages onto an external volume. It could be a USB thumb drive. It could be a disk image that you host on a web server. And then what that lets you do if you mount that disk image, you'll see that there is our bootstrapper script and a folder full of packages. And so I've booted into recovery mode. I have to open the terminal, so if, if you're allergic to, uh, to the command line, this is not going to be 
uh, not going to be f warm and friendly for you, but this is, this, is what, this is what we have to work with in the, uh, in the recovery mode. Open up a terminal, and I've made that disk image in my organization available at, a, at an easy to remember URL. So my technicians will write, you'll type in HEI util attach HTTP colon slash slash Mac bootstrap. And it comes back, tells me where that's been mounted, and then I can just type volumes bootstrap run. My script runs, shows me what volumes are available. I'm going to install to volume one. So all the packages that were in that extra folder get installed, and then I can choose to restart at the end. And when I do that, machine boots up, my bootstrap packages are in place, they take over, and now Monkey can, fin can finish configuring my machine. So it's a very similar workflow to what you would get with a no a no image workflow, an installation based workflow that you were using before, but in this case we're never using any external boot media. We're only booting from recovery. All right, so what, what does Apple want us to do? I, I've shown us a few uh, alternatives that we can use to set machines up, but you know, what's Apple thinking here? What, what, are they, what are they recommending for us? What do they want us to do? And I don't think anybody in this room is going to be surprised that Apple's recommendation is to get your machines en enrolled in DEP, use an MDM, and go from there. And what's nice is there's a, uh, an admin by the name of Eric Gomez, lives in Austin, Texas. And he, he's, he's made this transition in the last year or so, where he, he's moved his company to a, a fully DEP MDM enabled setup workflow, and he blogged about it. He, he wrote a lot about it. And we can all now you know, benefit from his, his knowledge sharing. So there's a series of blog posts where he walks you through how you can use DEP and MDM to bootstrap your machines. And the, um, the, the one thing to know is that, it, that his approach relies on an MDM supporting a feature known as install application. Not er every MDM vendor exposes that for use by us. Some of them don't, don't expose it at all. Some of them use it only to install their own agent. These three MDMs definitely support install application that you can use to install arbitrary stuff. And that's what Eric has done. He's using AirWatch. And when a machine where he works boots for the first time, it's in DEP. DEP says, hey, go talk to this MDM server and roll yourself in it. And that's what we're seeing here. And as they step through the, the setup assistant, the MDM is now running on that machine. It installs his bootstrapping packages, which in this case are Monkey, Chef, and a few other custom tools that he's written. And so when the setup assistant ends, the machine is busy setting itself up the rest of the way. So again, we've got a installation-based workflow, this, this time enabled by Apple's technologies and third-party technologies. Um, Victor Vranchen, who is the developer of uh, MicroMDM, has also written some posts on the subject. And he also has a workflow where you can, you can bootstrap your machines using his open source MDM into Monkey and continue on from there. So we talked about a lot of stuff. Here's the too long didn't listen in four slides. Don't use imaging to upgrade Mac OS. You might use imaging to set up or restore or repurpose a Mac, but it has to be the exact same version of Mac OS as what's already installed on the machine. And Apple is saying that you have to do it on the exact same hardware. It's not clear that that's absolutely necessary, but that's what they're recommending iMac Pro screws us all up because it supports secure boot, does not support net boot, and out of the box cannot boot from external media. So therefore, you might need some new setup workflows if you're going to support these. Recommendations. I've been harping on this for probably six, seven years now. Modularize your workflows. Uh, you, you don't want a monolithic workflow. You don't want to have my, your your setup shouldn't be a giant 1,200 uh, line bash script. It should be small pieces that you can put together in different ways and repurpose in other environments. And Apple installer packages, for all their faults, 
are a really good candidate for those modules because they can be used in multiple environments. If you haven't already, and I've resisted this for years, but you have to, you really have to implement an MDM at this point for Mac management. It's, the writing is on the wall, you, you just have to. And if your country supports it, I think probably all the people in this room live are from countries in which uh, DEP is supported, but maybe not, because uh, there still are many that, where it's not. But if your country supports DEP, get your Macs enrolled in DEP, because Apple's making changes such, such that being in an MDM by itself isn't good enough. It has to be a user-approved MDM. DEP kind of helps you with that. And make whatever your management software is, if it's Monkey, if it's Jamf, uh, FileWave, whatever, make it do most of the setup work. So you want to shift, shift most of that setup work. And that's why I recommended packages, because all of those uh, management systems know how to install packages. And if you can get whatever minimal stuff you need to do to get that management software to take over and install those packages and have it do the bulk of the setup work. And of course, things are going to continue to change. So whatever we've figured out today, we'll probably have to tweak it again in six months, and we'll have to tweak it again next year. We're constantly going to be reacting to the changes Apple throws at us. It's the first Mac that supports Secure Boot. It changes things a lot. You need to know how to deal with that. Uh, yes, your boss might be uh, reticent to spend $5,000 on a computer that maybe only you are going to use. Maybe Apple will come out with a cheaper computer that uh, supports uh, Secure Boot in the next couple of months. But then you're just that much further behind figuring out how you're going to deal with it. So I really recommend if in any way possible you can get your hands on an iMac Pro uh, do so. So, almost done here. We've got a link here where you can get um, uh, the links to many of the URLs, many of the tools that I've, I've pointed to. Um, so, you know, use your phone. There's a new, there's a new thing in iOS 11 that, that, goes, that uh, lets you quickly get the, uh, the um, QR code and do something with it. Good. I'm waiting for it to go throughout the, the whole. See, don't point your phone at unknown QR codes. No, that's the real one, as far as you know. Maybe it goes someplace else that you don't want to go to. Um, no, that one is for real. So, are there any questions? We've got a few minutes here. Oh, yeah, yeah, we can stay up here. I'll leave this up while I have some questions. Um, by the way, because I do work for a Hollywood studio, um, there is a post credit scene. <laughs> so, um, but I, I, let's take some questions right now if there are any. I guess, I guess I'll throw it. Oh, bang! <laughs> I am not an athlete. <laughs> did, I, did I get, who did I hit? Was it Sam? No. So, the. I'll go, I'll go one. Uh, okay. And then I there's a, there was a person behind you that had her hand up first. Oh. So, we're, we're going to be polite here. Oops. Okay, so uh, is this thing on? It is. Yeah. Okay, my question relates to um, DEP. Uh -huh. um, if you've already got a load of existing Macs and that you start up, you sign up to the DEP program and Macs you get thereafter are all DEP'd, mm -hmm. what do you do when it comes to repurposing existing Macs? What is there... One of the crappy old workflows. Uh, if you're lucky, some vendors will go back and, and add older purchases to the DEP portal. Um, they certainly have the capability of doing that. They might charge you to do that. They might say, no, it's not worth our effort. But they do have the capability. 
I suggested to our purchasing people uh, several months ago that on, even though we weren't enrolled in DEP at the time, that they get a written guarantee from them that they would add once we were enrolled in DEP. And if they said they wouldn't do that, that we would go find another vendor. I don't know if we would actually do that, but you know, you have some leverage with your vendors in that way, but they, they will go back, um, they can go back several years and add those um, to the DEP portal. The, the cool thing on iOS is with um, recent releases, you can just plug a, um, an iOS device into Configurator and add it to your own DEP uh, portal yourself. Can't do that yet with Macs. My guess is we'll be able to eventually, but it'll only be on newer hardware, and you won't be able to do it on older hardware at all. Anybody else? Uh, so with all the changes to, to use DEP um, and Apple Recovery, which is a very local process, yes. um, how do you foresee that we can support users remotely where in the old days we could remotely bless a machine to get it to Netboot uh -huh. and rebuild it while they're not there. Uh -huh. Whereas now, obviously, we, we lose all that functionality. So how do you foresee that we can have our service desk people remotely help people when you know, they're, they're just at the end of the phone or something like that? I think if the machine is to the point where you're going to have to re-image it or reinitialize it or whatever, whatever terminology we want to use for that now, um, being able to do so remotely is, is going away. And remember that anything that we can do to a machine uh, for good, because we're the good admins, uh, bad actors can use those same, those same techniques for evil. And Apple, Apple is more concerned about stopping the evil use than helping us continue the good use. So I think we're go that's, that's one, of, one of the casualties of the changes is that it becomes much more difficult to remotely recover a really hosed machine because you're not, they're not going to be able to hold down the end key and net boot. They're, you're not going to be able to remotely bless it to boot into <coughs> recovery. Um, yes, uh, that, that's going to require more human solutions and fewer automated solutions, sadly. I'm hoping some MDM-based tell me to reboot in the same kind of way that you can remote wipe instead of uh, remote, well, yeah, with and a remote wipe, and you're that's then a, that's initiating a, the DEP process again. And that's a great thing. point. Um, we need, as an admin community, continue to tell Apple what features we need from MDM. Um, it, it really does no good to talk to the vendor, the MDM vendors, because they can really only implement the MDM spec that Apple has, you know, supports in their software. So we really have to push Apple to, to add those features that, that we need to, to continue to use Macs in, in large organizations. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, following, maybe following up on, on that, that question, where do you see the, the future of uh, tools like Monkey or the locally running uh, Jamf agents or Chef going? Because in the, the same way that you could argue, well, what we can do with these tools because we are the good guys, um, it can also be a, a security vulnerability that it can be exploited. Do you You're, you're absolutely you right about that. And uh, a little over a year ago, there was a big scare going out where certain Apple systems engineers, sales engineers, were asking people what, what would happen to your organization if root level agents went away and the MDM was the only way to manage a Mac. And many of us were very, very concerned about that possibility because MDM just isn't, doesn't have a broad enough range of things that it can do to adequately manage Macs. We need to, the way we need to have them work in our organizations. Apple seems to have, b th maybe threw that out as a trial balloon. They, the, everybody that I've talked to at Apple recently says there are no immediate plans to do that. But, you know, five years is a long time. It could, you know, in, it could be completely different five years from now. And I think that's another reason why we need to continue to push Apple to uh, make MDM better. We want, what we would like is 
We want MDM to be an obvious no-brainer replacement for all of these third-party management tools rather than, oh my god, it doesn't work at all, what are we going to do? So if we can push Apple to, to make it a, a no-brainer replacement, then if they later pull away third-party agents, we won't feel so scared. Thank you. Does anybody want to see the post-credit scene? Yeah! It's not really a post-credit scene. Um, so the talk, the name of the talk is Imaging is Dead, Now What, or What Now? And you know, in a Hollywood movie, somebody dies, but then at the post-credit screen, there, the, the post-credit scene, there might be a hint that they'll be back for the sequel. Um, you can image an iMac Pro. I've done it. Um, you start with the installer. You need to have the, uh, the, the an installer for the version of OS that works for the iMac Pro. Um, Eventually, that'll be available on the App Store. It's not currently. Um, so I wrote a, a script that will pull the pieces down from Apple software update servers and assemble them into a, an install Mac OS installer. Uh, you can then pipe that into auto damage and build a deployment image. You can add additional packages to it, just like you would, just like you've done for a long time. You start that iMac Pro up into target disk mode. And you can restore your image just like you would before. Early days, I'm sure there's going, there'll be updates to other tools to make this um, easier to do. Uh, Google has a tool called Restore that is built for target disk mode imaging. It, it currently has, they've made some design choices that make it not work well with being able to restore an image to an iMac Pro, but I'm going to guess that that will be fixed eventually. But imaging lives on. And that's it. Thank you.